Hi all, thanks for uh, being prompt. Um, welcome to the third session of uh, the AAAF Lightning Talks. Um, as I've said in the chat, we're gonna give it just a few minutes to let people find the link uh, and then we'll get started and we'll take it from there. Hang tight. Hi all, welcome. We're just at uh, half past the hour. Um, we will, uh, as usual, give our little grace period um, so that people can find the link to the lightning talks um, for this session here. I still see uh, a bunch of folks streaming in. That's great. Um, what we will do, uh, I'll introduce myself and actually uh, I'll put Glenn and Caitlin on the spot. Maybe we'll introduce ourselves um, one more time uh, just so that you put names um, and uh, voices to face or to emails that um, uh, you might be getting from us in different aspects of the Black community. So um, I will start uh, by saying that my name is Josh Hadro. I'm the managing director of the AAAF consortium uh, and I work with Caitlin and Glenn to facilitate um, meetings and workshops and trainings and all sorts of things um, like this. So I'll, uh, I'll ask Caitlin and Englund to introduce themselves and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Perry. I'm the communications and community coordinator for IIIFC. Um, and like Josh said, a lot of my work is um, events like these and managing the things that the community is doing, getting that news out into the world and, and helping make things happen behind the scenes. Hi, I'm Glenn Robson. I'm the IIIF Technical Coordinator, so I help with the training, help with people uh, that have problems with IIIF or any questions, uh, and also help the uh, technical groups uh, keep moving forward. So good to meet you all. Excellent. Uh, thank you both. Uh, and so Glenn um, is going to help facilitate the um, uh, the videos of the lightning talks that we have here today. So. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we have pre-recorded videos of these lightning talks, but we do have, um, if not every single one, most of the people who were the presenters and the creators of these lightning talks um, who are able to uh, join us here. So we do have, we have both the most, many of the people here to answer questions if you have them, and we have a, a we should have a good amount of time um, after we go through these videos to, um, to go through questions as people have them. So we encourage you to put those in the, um, in the chat box there, or you can use the Q&A function. We'll, we'll monitor both um, as usual. So um, <clears throat> I think that's, uh, I think we've kind of slowed down on people coming into the room. So uh, I'll just end with sort of my general thank you to you all and well, welcome and thank you. Um, this is the last session of the AAAF uh, working and learning meeting. Um, as I've said, you probably heard me say, uh, we're really, um, eager to uh, have not just in-person meetings and in-person trainings and uh, and those kinds of things. We're really eager to establish um, patterns and rituals like these online meetings that, uh, that are really valuable to folks who can't necessarily travel um, to all the different places where uh, in-person meetings are happening. So uh, this is the final session of this year's um, iteration of that, but uh, we are eager for your feedback about this um, set of sessions and and other ideas that you have for us to uh, to put on workshops or trainings or uh, presentations of materials. So by all means, basically, uh, I, maybe we'll put it in the chat in just a second. But we're always eager for feedback. You can email us at staff at AAAF.io, um, and we're happy to take suggestions that way. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I will um, I will introduce the first video here, and then we'll get into those. And we have. Uh, a total of seven uh, presentations here, and then we'll get into some questions 
uh, related to those. But why don't we kick it off uh, with challenging legacies from Scott Bradley, Valentina Flex, and Graham Robson um, from Newcastle University. I'm Valentina Flex. I am the Gertrude Bell Project Archivist at Newcastle University. Um, and I'm going to begin our talk today by telling you a little bit about Gertrude Bell and the archive. And then I'll hand over to Scott, who will tell you about the website. So Gertrude Bell was born in Washington, County Durham in 1868, so she is quite local to the Newcastle area. Um, she was an archaeologist, a traveller, a writer. Um, she travelled extensively across the world, particularly in the Middle East, which is where our collection is very strong. Um, she was a member of British Intelligence, uh, working in the Arab Bureau alongside T.E. Lawrence uh, in the First World War. Um, and after the war, she was heavily involved in the creation of the Kingdom of Iraq. So she was involved in drawing the borders for the country um, and installing the monarch. Uh, she also founded the Iraq Museum, which is the first archaeological museum there, uh, and wrote the first antiquities law. And she died in Baghdad um, in 1926. So across Bell's work um, and life, she created so much documentation, uh, kind of showing her travels and the people that she met and the things she was doing and seeing. So in our archive, we have 12,000, over 12,000 unique records. So that's photographs, including negatives, albums, um, letters, diaries, reports and memoranda and notebooks. And um, so the collection spans 52 years, so basically her whole life, more or less. Um, and it covers a really wide geographical area, so Europe, East Asia, North America and the Middle East. Um, portrays lots of landscapes and people, many of which don't exist anymore. Um, so it's a really important record. Uh, and this was recognised by UNESCO in 2017 when they added the archive to the memory of the World Register. And it's highly used locally and internationally. It's one of our highest used resources at Special Collections. Um, and we also have our book collection, which complements that quite nicely. Uh, the project under which we made the website um, was funded by the Harry and Alice Stillman Family Foundation in America, and it really focused on digitization and cataloging, um, as well as a new website and exhibition. Uh, and the big kind of like impetus of this was uh, improving accessibility and preservation. So you can see here some examples of the digitization work that my colleague Graham has done. Um, one example on the left, you can really see the difference in tone um, and just the quality that comes with the new digitization. Whereas on the right, um, this is a image of one of Bell's photograph album pages. And this is the first time that we've had them as a digital surrogate and been able to make them available. Uh, and what we really wanted was a website where we could do that in the highest possible quality, giving basically users the closest experience they can have to handling the physical objects without having to be in Newcastle. So I'll hand over to Scott now to tell you about the website. Thank you, Valentina. Yes, I'm Scott Bradley. I'm one of the uh, library systems developers at Newcastle University Library. So yes, with the uh, old Gertrude Bell website, it was in massive need of an overhaul. The old site predated me starting at the new university and it required a lot of updating from the basic search to the way the image and metadata was presented, which you can see here, this being the old site search results page, which I'm sure we all agree looks very dated and you know not very helpful. Uh, and this is the new site using a better search engine and also employing facets on the left hand side to help you, you know, hopefully find the items that you want a lot quicker. When planning the new site, we knew we needed to incorporate IIIF because like Valentina touched on, it allows you know, for enhanced accessibility. IIIF allows users to interact with the material in a way that they haven't before. And it's especially true for a lot of Bell's uh, diaries and letters, for example, where Bell has uh, scribbled some notes in the margin. Which you, which you can see on this slide here, and even used tape at one point to stick in some pressed flowers. Trip Riot really brings those details to life. Zooming into these additions uh, makes the images a lot more richer and you know a lot more immersive. We also thought users would benefit from the ability to compare materials sort of side by side, something that was never possible before. Our digital asset management system, Content DM, is the thing that serves up the IIIF manifest, which we then consume into the Bell site. However, when we started to plan out the new site uh, and the functionality required, we realized that the IIIF that was generated didn't sort of meet our exact needs. So, for example, Bell has a lot of diary uh, and letters which are cataloged in Content DM as sort of what they call compound objects or sort of multi page documents, meaning the diary could be tens of pages long. However, on the new Bell site, we might only want to show a sort of subset of those pages. So, you know, for example, pages 10 to 17 of a diary. 
is the diary could have been written, you know, in different geographical locations, etc. And that's sort of how we catalogued on the Bell site, which you can see here. So in the in the background, we have the content DM, which for, with the diary entry, which I think it's about 260 pages. But then this uh, small image on the right in the sort of in the foreground is only showing pages one of two of that diary. Um, another requirement which we had that was sort of on our wish list was the ability to show items, uh, le uh, the items le uh, item level metadata rather than just object. Meaning when you're flicking through a multi-page canvas uh, manifest, you see the metadata for the item that you're on rather than just the sort of the general object level metadata. However, Content DM didn't allow for this. What we ended up doing after speaking with sort of the both, <clears throat> excuse me, both the developers of Content DM as well as the IIIF community, with something quite straightforward, you know, something that you know I kind of wish we'd thought of earlier. We just called the content D, uh, content DM API. So when the manifest is requested and before it's sort of served to the user, we make a call to the I think it's the get item info API, passing the collection and canvas ID, and in return we get the item level metadata for that canvas. Or we then sort of uh, need to do then is sort of repackage it and rebuild the manifest, including this new data. One problem we did encounter with this new solution, however, due to the number of API calls we could potentially make in, especially for those items with large, you know, a large number of canvases, uh, was longer than average page load times. So we developed sort of a basic caching mechanism and stored these cached items as basic text files on a local server. This cache is sort of cleared periodically, just in case colleagues make any updates to the metadata. We do have plans to further develop this cache into a more uh, more of a digital object repository where we can sort of bring in and store triple IF alongside other digital objects like TI and transcripts. Uh, but my colleague Valentina will will touch on that a little bit uh, in a moment. However, it is still very early days, so it's something I might be able to cover at a, at a future event. Okay, that's that's it for now. Thank you very much. So I'll just finish by letting you know a little bit about the work that we've got going on at the moment. Um, so we are in the middle of a project called Evolving Hands, in which we're using handwritten text recognition to create um, transcriptions from Bell's letters using the newly digitised images. Um, and they are being encoded with Text Encoded Initiative, so TEI, to add contextual um, historical information, just to level the playing field a little bit and allow people greater insight into the content of the letters, but also with the idea that the project is a kind of methodological study on how we do this as cultural heritage professionals and how we um, can incorporate these kinds of like digital humanities into what we do. Um, and the other project that we have going on at the moment is Beyond the Margins. Um, so we're going to be creating a geospatial interface, which will add to the website. Um, and geotagging all of the items and creating timeline narratives that kind of highlight particular stories within the archive. And both of these projects use the images that we have on the website and will pull the IIIF images through um, into kind of different interfaces. So it's like another way that we're using that in quite a um, flexible manner and for different reasons. So yeah, I hope that's been helpful and interesting. Um, and Scott and my colleague Graham should be here to take questions. And our emails are also here if you need to contact us. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you both. Um, wonderful to see that that interface and the updates there. Um, I will just encourage folks to put comments um, in the uh, or questions in the chat now. Um, not everyone can. Can necessarily say yeah we know it's hard to uh, manage all these different time zones and and get everybody um, in the same sessions but uh, if you do put the questions in now we can we can try and answer those uh, for those who can't stay through to the end um so with that um let's go to our next uh our lightning talk so um katarina agostini from university of notre dame is going to talk about uh, from manuscripts to digital edition Hello, my name is Caterina Agostini. I'm a scholar in the history of science and digital humanities at the University of Notre Dame. I'm delighted to be joining the IIIF online meeting, and I will be sharing with you my research titled From Manuscripts to Digital Edition, a IIIF Enhanced Analysis of Thomas Harris Treatise on Infinity. Thomas Harriot was a scholar with versatile interests in mathematics, astronomy, and navigation, living between 1560 and 1621. 
He was nicknamed the English Galileo, and in fact, that's what has drawn me to study these projects because I have started my career as a researcher studying Galileo Galilei. The fact that Thomas Harriot studied mathematics and astronomy at that time uh, became very interesting to scholars in the history of science, among them Franz von Zach found Harriot's papers of modern interest in the late 18th century. However, it became difficult to access the writings by Thomas Harriot because he had virtually published nothing in his lifetime. The only account that was published was his description of North America that he had explored with Sir Walter Raleigh. Regardless, Thomas Harry had been a very, very uh, productive scientist. He observed the moon using a telescope and recorded his observation. One of his books on mathematics was published after his death. And the books were eventually uh, attempted to publish several times in Oxford and elsewhere. But it was not until 2012 when a team um, gathered that the notebooks and the papers became available online, uh, courtesy of the Max Planck Institute in Berlin that made a version available with digital images and a transcription encoding initiative uh, equivalent. The project that has brought me to the Harriet Papers is a National Endowment for the Humanities and Arts and Humanities Research Council grant called Unlocking Digital Text. There are two purposes. First, making a digital and print edition of a section of the papers by Thomas Harriet, namely the Infinities on Infinity. And second, working to find an interoperable text framework that uh, cross-references and expands the visual and textual contents of Harriet's work via annotations so that the format becomes interoperable and not um, dependent on any technology. The project builds on an existing platform, Cultural Heritage Online Echo, hosted at the Max Planck Institute. And that became very helpful to have a roadmap of where we would find materials based on topics. The Text Encoding Initiative, or TEI, has been very popular for digital editions as a markup language for critical editions and documentary editions uh, alike. For ECHO, XML became a language for translating um, the unique arrangement of text on Harriet's uh, handwritten notes. And the project has been uh, ongoing since 2012. The contribution that I have brought to the project is to look at images via the International Image Interoperability Framework, or IIIF. So the high quality digital images online become a medium for um, high uh, quality viewing and annotations. There are specific aspects of this text that really make a case for a uh, triple IF. Um, since the author was intending to keep the notes private, every uh, aspect that helps us date and order the manuscripts uh, becomes uh, very helpful. For example, asterisks or small stars that refer to additions, insertions, or rearranged orders. Manicules, small hands pointing by um, Thomas Harriot towards texts that were uh, important and highlighted. But also titles, headings, blank pages, um, watermarks, as well as visual ways to capture mathematics, such as diagrams, doodles, as well as formulaic and um, geometric ways of studying algebra, geometry, and um, navigation. 
It is important to keep note of text that has been scratched out and struck through or rewritten because the pages have been uh, disassembled and numbered by uh, several people who were um, using these collections, including librarians in the personal collections that had inherited the papers. Transcribing manuscripts became uh, a synchronous uh, and also an asynchronous process for us working on transcription sessions worldwide. We worked on Zoom, uh, Notion, and Google Jamboard to annotate images and benefit from IIIF capabilities. We also had latex scripting for Harriet's unusual mathematical notations. And here you see an example of what it means to work uh, as a collaborative team on an editorial project and take into account the many variables that make a text a living document of Thomas Harriet's thinking process. We have found this uh, case study to be very productive for understanding project management dynamics because we have conducted uh, a synchronous transcription in a hybrid format. And we've used uh, Google Jamboard, Zoom, and Notion as a platform for hosting and um, storing files that we could later download in, in several uh, formats and mark down eventually. And this has allowed us to build a digital scriptorium around the, the Infinities by Thomas Harriet. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Uh, here's my information contact. Thank you so much for having me today. Great. Uh -huh. Thank you, Katerina. Um, so uh, I saw Katerina is, uh, is here uh, among the attendees. So uh, if there are questions, do put those in the chat. Um, we can uh, answer them in text or uh, by voice, maybe after we've concluded these. But um, so thank you. Uh, yeah. And then up next, um, whoop, uh, we will, uh, up next we have uh, presenting Recogito AAAF annotations using Parapleo from Gethin Rees and Stephen Gadd from the British Library. Today I'm going to talk to you about presenting Recogito IIIF annotations using Parapleo. Parapleo is a browser-based map interface developed by Rainer Simon as part of the AHRC-funded Locating a National Collection project. Parapleo is designed for discovery. The points on the map represent web pages. They represent the breadth of a cultural heritage or digital humanities collection, and users can click through these points to find a pop-up and then through to web pages. And because of the map uh, interface, they may discover web pages that they might not otherwise find. Secondly, Parapoyo is designed to be reusable. So anyone can make their own instance of Parapoyo available using their data in formats like CSV or uh, formats like the Recogito format, and then make this publicly available for free. Because thirdly, Parapoyo is designed to be sustainable. It's built on a using a browser-based model that allows hosting on GitHub pages which is free and requires less maintenance than other hosting solutions. I'll put examples of how Parapoyo has been used by different projects in the chat at the end. Now, where does IIIF come in here? Well, as I mentioned, Parapoyo is integrated with Recogito. So Many of you will be familiar with Recogito, which is an annotation platform that was developed by Pelagios and allows the user to firstly segment a part of an image using this box tool and secondly annotate that part of the image using a gazetteer URI. This creates linked data which is available for download and 
Parapoyo allows you to then take the data you've downloaded from Recogito and make that publicly available using a map on the web. Now, Recogito allows you to upload images, but it also allows you to pull in IIIF manifests. And on the Locating a National Collection project, Stephen Gadd really wanted to demonstrate what is possible with these Recogito annotations in uh, web map format. And so he drew on some previous work that a couple of volunteers on uh, the, the VI Regi project had done. They had done some fantastic work annotating this etching from the British Library's collections and made by Wentzlis Holler in 1660. They took this into Recogito and taken each of the small segments that you see in the etching on the left, which represent a landmark in England and Wales. On the right, we can see an example of this Tynemouth Castle, and the volunteers took each of these segments, drew that box around it, and annotated it with a gazetteer URI. Stephen then took this data and added it to per, per, a per instance of Perapleo, and what we see here on the map are points that represent each of those small images that you saw in the etching. And per, Stephen has modified Perapoyo to pull in the annotation from the IIIF server, as we see here for Tynemouth Castle. And then he's also enriched the data set with further cultural heritage organization URIs. So as we can, again, this is Tynemouth Castle, a visitor information from English heritage. So if you're interested in using uh, Parapoyo with your IIIF annotations from Recogito, or also just pulling in IIIF manifests or collections and visualizing those in Parapoyo and making those available to the public, please do sign up for this tutorial that's being held as part of the Link Pasts conference online on the 11th of December. I'll put the sign up form in the chat. Thanks for your time. Excellent. Thanks, Gethin. Uh, and thank you for adding in those helpful links to the chat. Um, that's great. Folks can take a look at those. Um, and great. Let me tee up next. Um, uh, we have creative responses to awkward documents and artifacts from Peter Pavement, uh, Valentin Baral, and Tara Burson. Hello, I'm Peter Pavement, the CEO of Surface Impression, a digital design and development studio that specialises in work for cultural sector organisations. IIIF is an amazing technology and joint effort between the cultural sector and academia, designers and developers and others. And it's really produced a valuable digital infrastructure for everyone. But the standard viewers and interfaces that are produced tend to cluster around the typical objects and artifacts that are found within collections, the book form or photographs or images of objects that fit within common templates, especially multi-page books and volumes. In this presentation, we're going to look at Silk Road manuscripts in scroll format from the International Dunhuang Program, as well as labor union banners from the Workers' Arts and Heritage Center. So my name is Tara Bursey. I am the executive director of the Workers' Arts and Heritage Center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. The Workers' Arts and Heritage Center has a permanent collection of several objects related to Canada's labor movement. And a cornerstone of our collection is an incredible collection of labor union banners from the turn of the 20th century to pretty much the present day. Banners are incredible objects, um, but very, very complex objects that benefit from close examination through virtual exhibitions. But it's a challenge to get there in terms of documenting them uh, for a number of reasons. One reason that comes to mind is most trade union banners are double-sided. So that poses the question of how you show off both sides of a banner, 
when traditionally in space, or at least in small exhibition spaces, uh, it may not be possible to show a banner in the round. The process of digitizing our labor union banners from our collection was really, really fascinating. And we had a wonderful photographer named Brody who helped us over the course of two or three weeks photographing a number of our banners. And after a lot of trial and error, Brody came up with a really interesting way of shooting the banners, uh, many of which were quite large. So in order to capture their size and photograph the entirety of the banner, he came up with a very interesting system of using a ladder, almost like a, a scanner, where he would brace the camera against the crossbar of the ladder and slowly and consistently move the ladder along the floor so that it was almost acting as a scanner, photographing banners that were in some cases about six or seven feet wide, maybe even more. Working with Tara and her colleagues, we've been creating an online exhibition called All Together Now, Banners of the Labour Movement. Central to this is a custom user interface that showcases these fascinating objects. Hey, my name is Valentin Baral. I'm a developer from Germany, working as Surface Impression. We want to show the banners in a way as if they were like real physical objects where you could just kind of have two pages and you go from the front side and you then go to the back side. But we thought that to really understand these objects, it would be better to kind of have them feel more real. Obviously, those banners do have two sides, but it's a, it's a plain screen. You, you can't look behind it. So what, what, what did we do? We, we, have to say flip button over here. If you press it, ooh, it turns around and you get to the back of the site. The main thing we use from the basic IIIF first, the kind of use of the deep zoom technology, because we have really high resolution versions of the, the banners. You can zoom into uh, the detail. Secondly, we're using annotations, but for that one, we kind of had to stylize it a bit more than it is usually done. Banners also have incredible details that show their history and offer insights about the organizational history of the union. So a perfect example is embroidery might be changed over the years in order to show changes of governance. So a few of our banners show ex amazing examples of that, where a union that may have been under the umbrella of the American Federation of Labor at some point in the 20th century then was under the umbrella of the Canadian Federation of Labor. So it moved from American governance to Canadian governance. And the really amazing thing about textiles is they're flexible enough and changeable enough that you could reflect that by taking out embroidery and then re-embroidering it. The International Dun Huang program links the collections of over 35 institutions around the world and provides access to and resources about manuscripts, printed materials and other items from the history and archeology span of the Eastern Silk Roads. We're working with the IDP to produce a new online platform that will enhance that access, especially to high resolution imagery of the digitized manuscripts, many of which come in scroll format. The problem we are facing here is that those scrolls are very long. To make it possible, we, we use Mirador as a basis. We load all the images of the scroll into one big view from OpenSea Dragon and build a whole bunch of navigational elements around it so users can find their way around. One of the biggest ones is the navigator, as we call it in the bottom, which shows the whole scroll as an overview. Yeah, the interface, you can ask very quickly navigate from one point to the other. It's possible to navigate between the individual components of the scroll. A big part was also that some of the scrolls have different reading directions. So we wanted to make it really sure first that people, when they initially started, they started at the beginning of the scroll and they also know which way they have to go then to kind of read it in the correct direction. Users can get a nice overview of the whole scroll so they really understand the scroll as it is rather than just getting small eclipses of it. These projects creatively adapt the flexible framework of IIIF and its viewers to respond to different objects and presentational forms. However, these are progressive enhancements. The content remains true to IIIF standards and intentions, remaining interoperable and remaining compatible with other IIIF viewers. IIIF can be used as a foundation for engaging experiences that centre on the needs of audiences and non-mainstream artefacts and incorporate many different interaction design and graphic design approaches. 
We look forward to seeing other creative and innovative solutions that this community will come up with to respond to the farther reaches of cultural heritage collections. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Peter, Tara, and Valentin. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I love seeing those examples of, uh, of, of attention to interaction design, not just for right, the majority use cases, but, but all the, the possibility space uh, in Triplea. Uh, wonderful to see. Um, well, great. Let us move now to uh, AAAF based research on 1930s Korean materials focusing on Washington Department store um, from Ji Sun Kim from the Center for Digital Humanities at the Academy of Korean Studies. Hello, I'm Ji Sun Kim from South Korea. I'm conducting a data driven cultural history study of modern Korea. Specifically, I'm creating triple data in RDF format to connect the materials I'm dealing with. Korean modern era materials primarily exist in image format and the media also varies. As various materials are scattered across multiple repositories, researchers face challenges from the stage of data correction. Despite the difficulty in correcting materials, Systematic organization of gathered data remains challenging as triple IF has not been adopted by Korean institutions or research centers yet. So I have been wondering how I could effectively organize materials. Uh, so in July of this year, I took an online training to run about triple IF and I have been applying it to my research ever since. Specifically, I'm using IF to organize images and video materials, mentioning or depicting Hwasin Department Store, uh, which is the only Korean department store in Seoul during the 1930s. Hwasin Department Store is a comprehensive cultural space that encompasses the economic, industrial, political, social, and cultural aspects of Korean society in the 1930s. Among them, I built a demo archive focusing on the eight types of material shown here. The first step in building an archive is to find the relevant material and create manifest. Uh, the difficulty at this stage was that, uh, excluding diaries, I couldn't find any triple IF image materials related to Hashin. So I uploaded images and videos to Internet Archive site and then generated different metadata for each material. And the second step is creating annotations. I have endeavored to annotate as faithfully as possible to accurately represent the specific structure of each material. Uh, this is a newspaper article mentioning or dealing with Hwasin Department Store. Hwasin Department Store in this article photo was also annotated based on the components of the Department Store. So here is the result. Furthermore, I added editor's comments for additional explanations. And Hwasin is frequently mentioned in newspaper serialized novel. Uh, in the case of a novel, I aimed to annotate it in a manner that fully captures the structure of the narrative. Any illustrations depicting Hwasin are also annotated. Next up is a magazine article. Magazine articles are also annotated by paragraph to accurately reflect the organization of each article. So here is the result. This photo captures a view of Hashin Department store in the 1930s 
uh, today the street remains bustling. I also annotated the units, buildings, or facilities comprising the Hwasin department of the store. Next is postcard. I broke down and annotated the elements depicted on the postcard. Hwasin department store is occasionally mentioned in personal diaries. Uh, the source shown here is a triple IF image, courtesy of Emory Libraries from a diary written in 1934 by the Korean intellectual. I also added uh, annotations to the diary entries, including the date, the place of writing, the weather, and the content. So here is the result. Lastly, there is video materials. The appearance of both the interior and exterior of Hashin department store can be observed in films and videos from the 1930s. Utilizing Twitter IF, I have also built a video material archive, allowing the compilation of related video materials in one place. So here is the restaurant, Hashin Department Restaurant. The resulting links have all been posted to the website below. If you would like to explore, please visit and take a look. Recently, the first workshop and conference introducing trip per IF was held in Korea. Uh, personally, I am very delighted. I hope Triple IF will be adopted more widely in Korea, and I also plan to organize image data based on Triple IF in the future. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Um, it's really wonderful to see the 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 extent of sort of digital humanities options um, in, in a project like that. Uh, and as you said, really exciting to see um, some awareness and and spreading adoption in uh, South Korea. Uh, and uh, last I'll note, I'm just we're really grateful that uh, that you found the training course helpful um, and that that helped you explore some of the capabilities in the uh, in the AAAF ecosystem. So uh, wonderful to see that that's um, evolving into to great work like this. Uh, so great. Let me interview, uh, introduce uh, our next. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sean Frago. Uh, this talk is uh, called Building Virtual Newspapers, Automatically Transforming AAAF Compliant Digitized Newspapers from Chronicling America into a Custom Digital Interactive Virtual Objects with a tool called BookSnake. Uh, and to talk about that is Sean Fraga from the University of Southern California. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Fraga, creator and project director for BookSnake, a new mobile app that lets you bring digitized materials out of online archives and explore them in the real world. BookSnake starts from the premise that close engagement with primary sources is foundational to humanity's research, teaching, and learning. For the past 30 years, GLAM institutions have been taking digital photographs of their collections and putting these images online. These are the world's cultural treasures, but they're trapped in an interface that fails to replicate the close engagement during in-person research. BookSnake is our solution to this problem. We leverage the augmented reality technology in consumer smartphones and tablets to recreate the embodied experience of archival research. BookSnake is thus a new kind of object viewer built for an age of mobile computing, and it's a way to democratize access to cultural heritage materials. Let me take you into our slides. Today, I'll be detailing our work to build virtual newspapers. Supported by an NEH Digital Humanities Advancement Grant, we designed and built a pipeline to automatically transform IIIF compliant compound objects into custom interactive virtual objects using the Chronicling America collection of historical newspapers at Library of Congress as a testbed. Let me start by showing you what BookSnake does. Here it is running on an iPad, and uh, when I open BookSnake, it'll launch into the library view, showing items I've added already. I'm going to take us over to the Explore tab, where we can use the Library of Congress button to search Library of Congress collections for the Minneapolis Observer. 
This is an African-American newspaper that had a short run in 1890. Here are the search results packaged inside the BookSnake app, so you can filter and sort. Here's one issue of this newspaper, and when I tap the blue Add to BookSnake button, BookSnake uses IIIF to retrieve the item images and metadata and begin the process of downloading them to my device. Here, when I tap the item in my BookSnake library, I get all of the metadata that's available in that IIIF manifest. And when I tap the blue View in Your Space button, BookSnake opens the live camera view and then superimposes a virtual object on physical space. And the object stays where I put it. BookSnake is using the cameras and sensors on the iPad to keep the virtual object uh, stable even as I'm moving myself and moving the device. And this makes it possible to engage with fluid embodied activities, like reading down a column of text in a newspaper without having to click and drag, click and drag, click and drag over and over. This is a compound object, so if we swipe across the page edge, we can open up the newspaper as if it's physically sitting there on the table. And again, as we zoom in, as we move around, it stays exactly where we put it. Here's how BookSnake does this behind the scenes. BookSnake uses IIIF to access and download the images and metadata, then uses Apple's Reality Kit to construct a custom life-size virtual object, and AR Kit to display the object and manage interactions, like turning pages. Much of our work concentrates here in taking the metadata that's available and using it to construct a life-size object. It turns out this is hard to do because few objects have computer-readable dimensional metadata. In general, digitizing an item involves physical dimensions, digitization resolution, and pixel dimensions, which are the product of the first two. This means that we need either an item's physical dimensions on their own or both the digitization resolution and pixel dimensions. We get pixel dimensions from an item's IIIF manifest. For Library of Congress, we built a reference table listing digitization resolution by item type as specified in the FADG standards. This is basically a custom client-side version of the IIIF physical dimensions service. So for the front page of the Minneapolis Observer, we know from the manifest that it's about 7,400 pixels tall, and we can divide the pixel measurement by digitization resolution to get physical dimensions. We're currently using 350 PPI or pixels per inch as our denominator there, and that's based on comparing pixel measurements for different selected newspapers against the physical dimensions listed for those titles in 19th century newspaper directories. And uh, here for this newspaper, that produces a measurement of about 21 inches, about 54 centimeters, and that should be accurate to within a couple of inches. BookSnake next creates a blank virtual object that matches the item's physical dimensions and proportions. This is like taking a piece of foam core and cutting it to size, creating a rigid plane with no content. BookSnake then takes the digital image and wraps it to fit the face of the virtual plane, resulting in a custom virtual object that matches the size and appearance of the physical original. BookSnake does this for each page image in a compound object, turning them into multiple individual virtual objects, and then arranges and animates these objects to create the illusion of a cohesive whole. This process happens on demand when a user starts an AR session, when they tap that blue view in your space button. BookSnake first transforms the first image into a virtual object. And so the user sees a newspaper waiting to be opened. And again, BookSnake is displaying this object at life size using the calculation method I just described. When the user swipes across the page edge to start to turn the page, BookSnake retrieves the next two images, transforms them into virtual objects, and aligns the object representing page two on the reverse of page one, and page three directly underneath page one. BookSnake then animates a page turn by rotating pages one and two together over 180 degrees with the object's spine serving as the central rotation axis. When the animation is complete, pages two and three have replaced page one, and BookSnake discards the virtual object for page one. This on-demand creation process means that BookSnake only needs to load a maximum of four images into AR space, optimizing for memory and performance. And by using a swipe gesture to turn pages, BookSnake leverages an affordance that users are already familiar with from interactions with physical objects. So you're not scrolling through the object like with microfilm, you're not tapping a next button and waiting for the following page to load.
I am incredibly lucky to be building BookSnake with smart, creative people in a collaborative, multidisciplinary environment. I particularly want to recognize BookSnake's developers, Christy, Henry, Michael, Zach, and April, all USC students. Christy and Henry are responsible for much of what you saw today. BookSnake is available as a free public beta for iPhone and iPad. Scan the QR code or go to booksnake.app to learn more and download BookSnake. We're building BookSnake to enable digital accessibility and connect more people with primary sources. And by demonstrating a novel method to transform existing IIIF compliant resources for interaction and augmented reality, we hope that BookSnake will drive wider adoption of IIIF. Thank you so much, and I look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, what a what a compelling. Uh, the only downside I, I was thinking about is the only downside to this is that uh, used to be you you got off a computer and you leave AAA up at the computer for a needed break, and now now you've introduced such a compelling way to to maybe introduce uh, newspapers and maps and into my living room. And uh, anyway, wonderful wonderful stuff. Can't wait to see how this develops further. Um, all right, then let us turn to our uh, last recording for this session, and then we can um, answer questions uh, as people have them. But uh, let's listen to Implementing Open uh, CC Licenses and Public Domain Tools from Connor Benedict of Creative Commons. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this lightning talk, Implementing Open CC Licenses and Public Domain Tools. My name is Connor Benedict, and I'm the Open Culture Coordinator at Creative Commons. The Open Culture Program aims to promote, encourage better sharing and open access to cultural heritage by developing policy guidance, legal infrastructure, such as our licenses and tools, and capacity building initiatives, such as this lightning talk, as well as the CC certificate and other training. The Open Culture Program is supported by a five-year grant from the Arcadia Fund until 2026. In the short amount of time that I have with you today, I would like to present a set of pivotal initiatives rooted in the recent publication of two reports. First, the Needs Assessment Report illuminates the findings from a 2022 survey on the utilization and implementation of CC's public domain tools. The second, the Barriers Report delves into the obstacles that impede cultural heritage institutions from embracing openness. If you are unfamiliar with our legal tools, we currently champion the use of six distinct copyright licenses, each varying in terms of permissions, encompassing aspects such as commercial usage and adaptation. Additionally, we endorse two public domain tools, which are CC0 and the public domain mark. The Creative Commons public domain tools are widely used in open access to cultural heritage because of their global recognition and simple legal design. CC0 is a legal public domain dedication which releases in copyright material to the public domain to the extent possible under the law. The public domain mark indicates the public domain status of material and is not a legal tool, but rather a label to explain the copyright status of a work. For digital cultural heritage collections, these tools have been instrumental in propelling the global open culture movement and making it easy and simple for institutions to clarify the copyright status of materials in their collections. Our survey of cultural heritage institutions gave us a number of insights and has helped us formulate strategies to improve the use of our public domain tools and copyright licenses. Chief among them is how cultural heritage institutions get credit for open access to heritage material. Unlike CC's copyright licenses, the public domain tools don't legally require attribution or credit of any kind, given the substantial investment and effort associated with maintaining and preserving a heritage collection, and then to add the digitization and dissemination of it online, institutions naturally seek acknowledgement when materials are shared and reused. There are a number of ways to ensure this happens. A working group for the Open Culture Program has proposed there are technical, legal, and social avenues that can all lead to the same result, which is that when cultural heritage material is shared with a public audience, it is clear where the material came from and who has made it available to use. While Creative Commons is well regarded for its development of legal infrastructure, the licenses and legal tools, in this particular instance, a social or technical intervention may be more accessible for institutions to implement and promote. In this context, we see the IIIF community as pivotal stakeholders and partners in the development and execution of this strategy. This could include the creation of guidelines and resources that endorse best practices and encourage desired behavior among users of cultural heritage material.
Additionally, our analysis of more than 63 interviews with cultural heritage professionals in the Open Culture Voices series has shown the critical barriers that must be surmounted by institutions to open their collections online. These can be separated into three main areas, which are money, people, and policy, and we discuss them in detail in the report, What are the Barriers to Open Culture? Cultural heritage institutions often grapple with limited financial resources and personnel, which can impede the development of open access strategies. Furthermore, there currently exists no international legal policy framework that adequately safeguards and promotes the endeavors of cultural heritage institutions to make their collections accessible online. In the absence of legal certainty, institutions hesitate to digitize and share their collections. Our most recent initiative, called TERAC, or Towards a Recommendation on Open Culture, aspires to develop a positive international policy framework that champions open access to cultural heritage. Last year, the UNESCO Mondial Cult Declaration stated that culture is a global public good, and an international instrument for open culture holds the potential to transform this vision into reality. In this endeavor, we also recognize IIIF as an instrumental stakeholder and partner in shaping this initiative for open culture. These are just a few examples of initiatives that you are more than welcome to contribute to. An additional avenue for engagement is participation in the Open Culture Platform, where we engage in regular discussions concerning these initiatives and explore various opportunities within the community. You may also consider enrolling in the CC Certificate course on Open Culture, which offers a comprehensive exploration of the legal dimensions of licensing and rights clearance, along with guidance on the broader use of CC licenses. Lastly, you are more than welcome to reach out to me via email should you wish to become actively involved in our work. Your attention today is sincerely appreciated, and I eagerly await any questions you may have. Thank you. Great, uh, and thank you, Connor, for for uh, that uh, that bridge and connection between these communities. I think you're exactly right. Um, so that concludes the, the set of recordings that we have for this uh, lightning talk session, but we do have uh, some time. Um, if there are people who uh, have some questions uh, they wanna ask, uh, you can either put them in chat or I think, um, I think we're a, uh, a stable enough group uh, that we can handle on unmuting. Um, I don't think it'll be total chaos. So if you do have a question, feel free to, um, uh, yeah, to, to ask and, uh, and Many of the contributors are uh, able to be here, though not all. And if uh, there's questions for those who um, uh, who couldn't stay on, um, we're happy to direct those questions and connect folks. Um, that's something we could definitely do. But uh, what questions do folks have? Maybe to warm us up, I know there was a question you answered it briefly in the um, uh, in the chat. But Sean, do you want to say any more about uh, Android plans and, and next steps? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, thanks, Josh, and uh, thank you to Cassie for asking the question. Um, yeah, so BookSnake is currently available for iPhones and iPads. If you have an iPhone or iPad produced in the last five years that can run iOS 17, the current version of, of the operating system, BookSnake will work on that device. And uh, we built for iPhone and iPad first as a development decision um, because the development environment for Apple devices is easier overall. There's more consistency in hardware. Um, and is particularly easier for the kind of development we're doing here for augmented reality development, um, which is pretty messy because it has to continuously integrate real world data from cameras and sensors. So we built for iPhone and iPad first um, as an experiment, a way to figure out how to build this pipeline of connecting IIIF uh, web-based resources to the um, AR, engines on the devices themselves and our next step is to take what we've learned from that process and uh, expand it out to android using the the augmented reality frameworks uh, available through google and um the the broader goal in doing so is to make booksnake widely accessible on existing mobile devices making existing devices that people already own more useful um and one of the particularly exciting things about building for mobile devices is that um, 
uh, certainly in the United States, and I think globally as well, more people own mobile devices, uh, smartphones and tablets, than own traditional laptop or desktop computers. And so mobile devices are a really exciting place to engage uh, a broader public that you can through uh, through traditional desktop web. Um, and building a version of BookSnake for Android is part of our strategy for reaching the, the broadest community possible and making BookSnake as accessible as possible. Amazing. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. And you're exactly right. I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity with BookSnake and and uh, in many ways for um, better and, and more comprehensive mobile delivery of, of AAAF uh, kinds of material. But great. Um, other questions uh, or, or, you know, um, uh, thoughts people have. Uh, I see Katarina paste, uh, pasted a link to um, to the uh, the Harriet papers. Um, the question: What kind of metadata would you want to see in the, the metadata dimension for to make BookSnake work for um, yeah for collections? That's the usual. Yeah, this is a really important question. Um, thanks for asking. Dimensional metadata is at the core of uh, the BookSnake experience because it's how BookSnake creates realistic virtual objects, ones that are are true to life size. Uh, and that aren't too large or too small. Um, I'm putting in the chat here a link to some documentation on our website that describes the different kinds of dimensional metadata that BookSnake can work with. Very briefly, there are three types that we look to. One is listing the physical dimensions of an object in the catalog record itself in the IIIF manifest, and ideally giving these as uh, separate values for height and width um, as numbers, so not as a text string, but in a computer readable format. Uh, and that allows BookSnake to directly create virtual objects that reflect the size of the physical original. The second way of parsing dimensional metadata is uh, by inc including um, information or metadata about the digitization process in a catalog record and a IIIF manifest. So if we know that an item was digitized at 300 PPI, or 600 PPI, uh, and we have that value in the uh, manifest itself, we can use that in combination with the pixel dimensions that are provided in the manifest to calculate the physical dimensions. And then the third strategy, which is what we use with Library of Congress, um, is to use information about an institution's digitization pipeline um, outside of the manifest to create a reference table uh, so that BookSnake can use some information, some value uh, within the manifest itself, whether this is a unique object identifier, um, the collection that it belongs to, the type of media it is, really any metadata facet, and associate that in the reference table with the digitization resolution. Uh, and then it can, as before, use that in combination with the pixel dimensions to, to calculate the, the physical dimensions. Um, and this is an active area of research for us. So looking ahead, we're interested in developing ways to take um, human readable descriptions, often in a, a physical dimension, a physical description field or a, a medium field in a catalog entry, something that describes in a, a prose form what the dimensions uh, of an object are, and automatically parse those to extract the relevant numbers uh, and pass those to BookSnake as a way of creating um, um, uh, uh, realistic life-size virtual objects. So again, more information at that webpage, um, and I'm always happy to talk more about the particulars of how a given institution provides dimensional metadata or digitization information about their individual collections. Excellent. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, a lot of intriguing possibilities there. Um, uh, shifting gears a little bit, we have a, a question for Connor Benedict, um, uh, basically asking, is there anything specific that AAAF and uh, AAAF community could start doing now to facilitate um, open culture and promote legal interoperability? Um, Connor, I think you're, yeah, here, still with us. Um, to promote interoperability. Um... I mean, using using the public domain tools. Well, first of all, thank you for the question, Tom. Um, yeah, using the using the public domain tools is one key way to promote interoperability. I think um, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of institutions getting credit, which is something we're working on. So, how institutions are um providing attribution statements or what kind of information information they're providing to their users i think there's um work to be done there which is something i'm 
trying to create momentum for, if that kind of answers your question. Thanks, Connor. Yeah, I think um, I think that's great, and I think that works very nicely with um, with the elements of Triple F Manifest that uh, you know that carry those uh, those attributions and and rights elements. Um, uh, I think this is another follow up for Sean, just about um, uh, rulers and um, you know uh, I forget the name, you know um, test strips. So would that be useful? Is there, a, is there an element there? Yeah, this is another great question. Um, this, we're at the very beginning of exploring how reference targets or color bars or other dimensional scales included in an image itself uh, might be a potential useful source of metadata. Um, after the new year, I'm starting a collaboration with some of the data, data science folks here at USC uh, to explore whether we can download an image, uh, use machine learning to identify the reference target within that image, um, and because the reference target has consistent physical dimensions, use the reference target dimensions to then calculate the dimensions of the item that it is pictured with. Um, so very early days at this point, but we're trying to be as creative as possible to use existing digitized collections and use whatever information is provided either explicitly or implicitly to extract that dimensional metadata. Um, and something that I want to mention about this new phase of work of working with existing metadata in digital collections, obviously this will benefit BookSnake by making it possible for us to create life-size virtual objects. Um, but we want that work to flow back upstream uh, to provide so that the project can provide ways to archives and institutions um, to make these calculations on collection materials that they already hold and incorporate those computer readable physical dimensions into the catalog records uh, and into the IIIF manifests associated with those items um, so that this work to extract metadata from a physical dimension field to identify a reference target and calculate physical dimensions from that um, benefits more than just BookSnake, but then provides metadata to augment existing records um, so that institutions can work with physical dimension data within their existing um, online environments and potentially support additional immersive technology projects. Very exciting. Um, uh, this is a question for uh, for Peter Pavement and and others if they're um, if they're still on here, but uh, just asking about whether that uh, scrolling viewer is is uh, is available for general use with other Triple F manifests. Um, it will be, <laughs> I can say uh, it's it's a not yet released uh, project as yet, but when um, it, it is, which should be some point early next year, then. Um, I think we'd be very interested in uh, making that source available uh, on an open source basis. And um, uh, it, I should point out that it's a it's written as a plugin for Mirador currently, and um, uh, so basically you can slot it into Mirador if you're using that. Um, but it, we're also um, in the pipeline is is to do the same thing for Universal Viewer at some point during next year. Um, I think we want to prove it in the one platform first and then and then kind of move on. But uh, yes, uh, very open to um, collaboration, to reuse, to um, the whole general principle of open source. So uh, feel free to be in touch. That's great to hear. Thank you, Peter. Um, and and if and when, uh, or I should say when, when you have more on that, um, by all means, let us know uh, at staff at AAAF.io. And that's the kind of thing we love to put in the newsletter. Um, we'll put links there and, you know, people interested can, uh, can hopefully discover it that way. Um, that's great. great. We'll do that. Thank you. All right. Absolutely. Um, uh, just another note to, to Connor to uh, a possible pointer to the sorcery folks um as a as another point of connection that tom mentions there um are there other questions that uh, that folks want to ask give folks a minute to think here okay maybe we'll make a last call 
uh, get those gears turning. If there's any last burning items um, on your mind, then let us know. But barring that, um, I think uh, I will uh, just sort of wrap things up a little bit and, and say a big thank you. Um, I want to start by saying um, thanks to Glenn and particularly Caitlin for all the work that went into um, organizing and shaping this and uh, and doing the work to communicate and all that. Um, really a lot of tremendous work. Uh, really, really happy to see this come together uh, and, and conclude with this uh, set of lightning talks. Um, yeah, and the last thing um, I'll say, uh, well, it's just a thank you to all the contributors. So not just this lightning talk session, but uh, everybody who uh, worked on all this throughout um, throughout the week. So all the people who put together lightning talks uh, as well as workshops. So um, uh, a lot of successful things. I think we'll be doing a lot more in 2024 um, to to resurface a lot of the, the new um, implementations and innovations that, uh, that we saw a lot of this week. Um, so look for that in the newsletter and elsewhere. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll end with is just a thank you to you all. I've said this uh, many, many times, um, but it's really AAAF community. It's really the attendees here who, uh, who bring their enthusiasm and excitement uh, and eagerness to solve problems um, and do it together uh, that makes this work. So um, thanks for joining us. Uh, and I will say, I'll ask Caitlin if there's any other logistics to mention before, before we sign off. Yeah, so no other logistics. I will be hard at work um, breaking up all of these videos and making them um, functional and usable. And those will be up on the IIIF YouTube and I'll announce it in the newsletter. Um, maybe someone could put a link to sign up to the newsletter in there. Um, we send them out 10 times a year so you won't get spammed. Um, but I also think we would be remiss if we didn't take a moment to thank Josh, not just for um, facilitating over the last three days, but also the last five years. This is Josh's last um, IIIF online meeting, and he's done a fabulous job, not just this week, but um, in promoting the IIIF consortium, um, helping to mature it and shape it as we've grown. So um, I think we should give Josh a round of applause before we finish up today. Thank you, folks. Um, no, it's been real, been my real pleasure, uh, and really, everybody here makes it easy. Uh, I've I've said this before, but I thought pitching AAAF would be harder, and never once did I ever hear anybody disagree. Everybody, once they hear about the benefits and the community, they are just um, really eager to be a part of it. So uh, I'm going to stay connected, and uh, yeah, we'll see more, and I'm excited for what comes next. Bye. All right. Thanks, Bye folks. All. Take care and have a great week.